Okay, so this is how we're going to create a character for RuneQuest using the 2018 release of the rules by Chaosium. I have given it some thought um, and I have decided to go for somebody from Old Tarsh. Um, and I'm just going to read you um, the information about Old Tarsh in the... Um, in the book, from the book, um, the information that they provide is usually about a, a page. If you take out all of the tables and if you take out and remove all of the all of the pictures, the Tarsh exiles or sh or old Tarshites are a group of tribes in the foothills of Mount Kero Finn that refuse to acknowledge the overlordship of Furthest. They maintain their precarious independence from their base at Winter Top 4, where good defensive terrain and the protection of the Shaker Temple provides them refuge. Prior to 1582, Bagnor was the capital of the Tarsh exiles, and a line of fortified cities and towns from Dunstop to Slave Wall defended their independence. One by one, these cities fell to King Moriades, the resurgent Lunar King. Uh, the Taj exiles have little arable land and support themselves through herding, hunting and raiding. It's important that we have the raiding bit here because I'm going to explain to you later why this is important. Stereotype. The Taj exiles left their homes after the Lunar Empire conquered their territory, having decided it was better to live as wild robbers close to the grim goddess Maran Gore than to submit to the hated empire. They are a hard and ruthless people scorning the plough in favour of raiding. Common attitudes. The old Tarshites are tough, hardy and ruthlessly practical. They are devoted to the gods of earth and air. We're going to take this down as well, as well, the gods of earth and air. <clears throat> who rule their land. Politics. The Shaker priestess is the unquestioned authority, but does not involve herself in mundane issues of justice, trade or pre petty raids. In 1625, the Shaker priestess appointed Unstai, Unstai of Win Wintertop to be the king of all the Tarsh exile clans. Important cults. The native gods of Old Tarsh are the Lightbringers and Earth Pantheons. Arnalda and Orlanth are the most popular cults and worshipped by most farmers. Maran Gore, the Earth Shaker, is a very important goddess for the tribes of Old Tarsh, particularly those near Kero Finn and the Shaker's Temple. Humakt is the primary war god. The other Lightbringer cults um, are popular throughout Old Tarsh. Odaila and Yinkin are both popular hunters gods. Climate. Wintertop is, a, is in a mountain valley at the base of Kero Finn Mountain. Its climate is strongly influenced by its proximity to that huge mountain. Let's switch on the light. That's much better. Um, it receives the most snow of any human settlement. That's really important because I wanted to play something that is close to nature and quite harsh. Its elevation is approximately 850 meters. Regions, bush range, culture, religion, Tarshite or Lanthi. These rugged hills are dotted with ancient ruins from other ages and populated by herders, hunters and bandits. Dinosaurs are plentiful here, making farming difficult. Locations, falling ruins. This ruin is cursed and dangerous. It is notorious for the fragments of a mystical ladder which still fall from the sky into the ruins from time to time. Within the ruins lives Eleminoria, the great temptress who can grant wishes for a terrible price. Miss Gander's Tower. This tower was built as a refuge by a powerful mystical advisor to King Moriades, exiled by Jar'il, uh, the Razoress, in 1610. Dragon Pass. This gap in the Dragon Spine Range, about 25 kilometers southwest of Wintertop, provides the easiest passage north and south through the region. The gap was once built to resemble a tremendous dragon with a ga gaping maw through which traffic must pass. Much of this was damaged during the final fight against the Empire of the Worm Friends. Um, Kero Finn. This incredible peak towers 12 kilometers into the air. Let's, let's, let's rephrase this. 12,000 meters. Mount Everest is less than 9,000 meters. So this is huge and is visible from hundreds of kilometers around. It appears like a needle rising out, upward out of sight into the sky. The most important of the great sacred peaks of the Olanthi Kero Finn is usually cloaked in clouds as befits the mother of Olanth. Shaker Temple. 
Um, culture and religion, Tarshite Earth Pantheon, ruler, shaker, priestess. This is the largest earth temple complex in Dragon Pass, with strong ties to the Tarsh exiles at Winter Top 4. It is home to Marangor, goddess of earthquakes and destruction, and sister of Ernalda. It was built where the blood of Grandfather Mortal was spilled. Winter Top. Culture, religion, Tarshite, Orlanthi. Ruler, King Unstai. Wintertop Fort is the highest settlement upon the steep approaches to Kero Finn. It is a small town ready to provide porters, climbers and haulers to anyone who pays. The inhabitants call themselves the Tarish Exiles, are openly anti-Luna or Lanthi, and have allied themselves with the bloodthirsty priestesses of the Shaker Goddess. Um, and that's all there is. Um, it then gives you um, the winter top temperature and um, rest precipitation. Um, and I think this is degrees centigrade. So um, we have uh, two, four, six, eight, ten, eleven seasons. Um, see early minimum temperature two, maximum temperature 16. And, the, uh, um, and in the uh, sacred time, which is the... The deepest winter, uh, well, the deepest winter is dark late, minus eight to minus two degrees centigrade. So there are times when there is, uh, when it's below centigrade, uh, below zero all the time. All Tarshite names, female and male. So we're going to go with a female. We're going to look at them. So we've got Durlindia, Erantha, Ernadali, Harsta, Incarne, Jorendona, Kerentha, Oriane, Sandene, Yarambora, Yenesting. I'm going to go for Kerentha. So we're going to call ourselves Kerentha. We are in Old Tarsh, it's our homeland. And we are female. And that's number one. So we're going to start saving now. Okay, so um, let's get started. So we've done this and now we're going to go back to the uh, beginning of the character creation because that is the first thing that you need to do. Um, you, the first step one is you decide on your homeland. Um, Old Tarsh is a group of tribes centered on the foothills of Mount Kero Finn, blah, 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 blah. Cultural skills for Old Tarshite adventurers are provided on page 63. Let's take a look at page 63. Um, the Tarshites get, the, the Old Tarshites get dance plus five. So we go in here. Um... No, we're actually going to do this at the end. So we're going to say dance plus five. Um, we have ride plus five, sing plus ten. Um, we speak our own language, Tarshite. We can put this in. Um, that's at 50 already. So that's um, kind of normal already let's see so um ride is usually five and we get a plus five to that um sing um other language trade talk plus 10 so we're going to put this in here So that's like the common tongue. So we're going to put in a 10 here. We're going to put in a 50 here because at the moment this isn't going to change. Um, customs. Tarshite. And here we are at 25 at the moment. We get farm plus 15, 
survival plus five, spirit combat plus 15, dagger plus 10, battle axe plus 15, one handed spear plus 10, broadsword plus 10, composite bow or sling. I'm going to go for a sling because composite bows are probably very expensive. Javelin plus, plus 10, medium shield. Because it's one thing to have the ability, but then the question is, where would you have learned it? Plus 15 and large shield plus 10. And would she be able to afford one? Because I've been told that they are actually very expensive. So, um, this is because she's from Old Tarsh. So these are the, um, the, um, <clears throat> the cultural skills that she has. Um, then we have the starting passions. Gloranthan epics are full of characters with conflicted loyalties. Um, so basically this means that, um, yeah, uh, their life is complicated. Um, deadly feuds and raging passions. This game encourages such themes through qualities called passions. Game mechanics for quantifying your adventurer's emotional propensities. As a member of a homeland, your adventurer starts with three passions at 60. Depending on your family history, these passions may increase or decrease. Passions and their use uh, in play are described in the passions and reputation chapter. So... Um, specific passions described. There are some of the more, um, these are some of the more common passions. So essentially, we have the homeland based passions and we are old Tash. So we have love of family. So we're going to go down there. We're going to put this in here. Um, love family, 60%. Um, Loyalty clan, 60, and loyalty shaker temple, 60. And that's interesting because you actually don't have this because those are the homeland based passions. Okay, so we'll just have to put this in here. Shaker Temple at 60. So yeah, I think that this is um, what we need to do here. Next, we do the family history. Your adventurer's family history strongly influences their drives and passions. Occupations are largely hereditary in Glorantha. What I'm going to do is I'm going to redo what I just did because I think it's easier this way. So we're going to go down to the or up to the um, up to the abilities. So we have dance plus five. So we're at 15 at the moment. We have ride at 10. It doesn't specify what we can ride, but we will just put it in there. So I guess it's horses. Sling. Um, here we are at 15 because we get 10 because we are old Tarshite. Um, trade talk, we've got in there. Customs, yep, we've got those. Farming plus 15 and so we're at 25. Considering that we despise the plow and that's interesting. Survival is um, 
Spirit Combat plus 15. Um, so we're at 35. Dagger plus 10. So we're at 25. Battle Axe plus 15. Hmm. I can't even see Battle Axe. So it means we're probably going to put this in here. Yeah. Fifteen. The one-handed spear includes lances, so we're at fifteen now because we get a plus ten. Broadsword plus ten, so we're at twenty. Um, sling, we did javelin at twenty because we get a plus ten. Medium shield. 30 and large shield 25 okay so okay so that's great so um this we have done so now let's take a look at our family history this section this section can be used to generate a deep family background for your adventure providing them with a rich personal history connections to their family and community and additional benefits to skills and passions Pick which family member had the most important impact on your adventurous sense of identity. First, decide the grandparent that is most significant to your adventurous story. We're going to go with our granddad. Um, and we're going to put them into the same clan because that's easiest. Um, And then we roll for our grandparents' occupation on the occupation table. For this, we need to roll a d20. So let's hope this works. And we rolled a 16. And they were a philosopher. I'm not sure if this actually works for my area. I'll actually have to do this again because we don't have philosophers. This is not... Um, Again, a 16. Okay, I think the system is telling me something. One more time. It's a 16. A three. Chariot driver. Yeah, I can live with that. So he's a chariot driver. God knows, he might have actually descended from the mountains. And then... Um, uh, so we have... So he's a chariot driver. Um... If the occupation seems unusual for that homeland, roll again or pick an appropriate result. Your parent does not have to belong to the same homeland as your grandparents. Similarly, your adventurer does not, blah, but we're, we're going to do this. Determine the occupation of your grandparent and parent. Use the occupation table to choose or randomly determine your grandparents' and parents' occupations. Um, usually you have the same occupation as your forebears, but it says you can always pick your adventurer's occupation regardless of what your parents' or grandparents' occupations were. My, and then my, my parent is my mother and she was a, I would say that she was a hunter. So there I'm going to pick, so she's going to be a hunter and I am going to be a bandit and I'm going to explain to you why later. Me, bandit. Okay. Determine events. Determine what events your grandparent and parent participated in. You may choose the event or roll a d20 to get a random result, depending on your homeland or your ancestor's homeland, if you wish that uh, to be different, blah, blah, blah. So basically how this works is your grandparent was born in 1561. And then 21 years later, they started to basically adventure. So now what we have here is a table of events that happened. In 1582, all homelands participated in the following event. King Tarkalor and his wife, the Feathered Horse Queen, went to war with the Lunar Empire to aid the old Tarshites, namely us, aided by Praxian and Esrolian mercenaries and volunteers. The Red Emperor personally led the Lunar Army, and when the armies met at the Battle of Grizzly Peak, 
The lunar army swept the field with their vastly superior magicians. Both King Tarkalor and his queen were killed. Of special note, your parents, your parents were born this year. So, um, let's see. We're going to roll. Um, and we have to roll a d20 for the 1582 events. If you are from Ezrolia or Prax, you get a minus five to the d20 roll. If you are from the Grayslands, Old Tarsh or Sartari, you get a plus five. So what we're going to do is we're going to roll a d20 and see what happens. And we rolled a 14 plus five is 19. Your, gra your grandparent was present at the Battle of Grizzly Peak. Okay, so present at um, Grizzly Peak. Okay, so, and then we need to um, roll a d20 again. If we're a noble or a priest, we get a plus five. We are neither, or our grandparent wasn't. So we're going to roll a d20 again. And we rolled an 11. If Luna Tarshide, your grandparent died. If other, your grandparent was killed by Luna spirits. Okay, so if you are a Luna Tarshide, if they were a Luna Tarshide, your grandparent died in battle. You gain loyalty, Red Emperor or King of Tarsh. If other, your grandparent was killed by Luna spirits. Gain hate, Luna Empire. So now what we're going to do, so basically they died and were killed and was killed by spirits, by Luna spirits. And they were killed. So, bam. This means our grandparent is now out of history. So we don't have to go on in this vein. But um, what we're now going to do is we are now going to gain hate of Luna Empire. And um, the question is, do we get a, how much do we get for this? Let's see. Let's look at Vazana and her story. Because that should um, actually tell us something. Um, Um, it doesn't really say how much hate you get. Okay. Um, is it 60? Um, Um, okay, so I have no idea what their hatred is. Um, maybe this will be revealed later. Okay, so basically my um, grandparent is now dead. So we switch over to my parent. And um, <laughs> so grandparent, 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 grandparent. Um, sixteen oh eight. They were. In 1608, they were, let me see, 1824. 
um, and in 1608, the participant, uh, the participating homelands are Luna, Tarsh, and Prax. The Luna Empire invaded Prax. The Luna army hopped from oasis to oasis, but was raided and harried until it accepted peace before being allowed to enter the Paps. Despite propaganda, this was a nomad victory. So, um, first of all, we're going to um, we're going to um, determine the number of um, siblings that my parent has. So we're going to go for a d6. Bam. One. Um. Oh, 1d6 minus 1. So my mother has no siblings. Okay. Then we're going to go for my father. And he has five. Okay. So, uh, yeah, let's keep going. Um, so, um, okay, now we have to... So we have, okay, so we have sibling one, two, three, four, five. And now we need to determine if they are still alive. And we do this by rolling a d20. Sibling one. On a three, alive and married. Ah, G is gender. Okay, we will have to determine this later. So we're going to say they're married. Oh, no, these are... Okay, so aunts and uncles. So we have... Um, we're going to go for... Um, a D4. 1 to 2 is female. 3 and 4 is male. So this is... Oh, God, what is this? Um, so this is male, and they are married and still alive. Let's take a look at number um, sibling number two, or aunt number two, or uncle number two. That's a three, also male. Um, they're male. Let's check if they are still alive. Or, and or married and whatnot. So they are dead, but was married. So it means that there is a an aunt or uncle in the mix that was kind of like married to this guy. Um, here we have another three, so another male. Male. Let's check. If they are still alive, three, alive and married. Then we have four. That's a, um, that was a woman or is a woman. Let's see what happened to them. They are a four, so they are alive and married. Okay, then, then we have one more. And that's a three, so another guy. Um, male, and let's see, da, 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 d20. On a 13, they are alive and unmarried. Okay, so now I know a little bit about my aunts and uncles. Well, I've got one aunt and possibly an um, an aunt that was married to my uncle or maybe there was another uncle in the mix who knows we could determine this but we're not going to do this now um okay so um then let's take a look at my mother's history da, 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 da. so um uh here we are so da, 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 da. that was my okay 1608 um, 
basically they invaded Prax, blah, 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 blah. The lunar army hopped from oasis to oasis, blah, 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 blah. So now we look at, if we are old Tarsh, we have the year 1608 events. Um, we are old Tarsh, so we get a minus five to our d20. Let's take a look. We're going to roll a d20. And it's 18 minus 5, it's 13. And on a 13, we have a normal year. And so nothing really happened. So my parent is still alive. Then we move to year 1610. Participating homelands, Luna, Tarsh, and Prax. So um, we have to roll a d20. The Lunar Army, this time better prepared and equipped, they're not giving up, marched into Prax and defeated the nomads in battle, then occupied the surrendering city of Parvis, Jarel, the Razorus, a Lunar Demi, sorry, and occupied the, sur uh, the surrendering city of Pavis. Jareel, the Razoress, a lunar demigoddess, came to Tarsh and liberated King Moriades to transcend his mortal coil. Although she later gave birth to Moriades' son, the king's eldest son, Farandros, became king of Tarsh. Okay, so 1610. Let's see. We roll a d20. And since we are all Tarsh, we get a minus 10 to this roll. So it's a 1. Um, a normal year. If Luna Tarshite, then you witnessed Jareel liberates the king. We didn't. So we have a normal year. Again, we're still alive. Hey, cool. So um, normal year, normal year. So we're still alive. Uh, oh, my, my parent is still alive. My mother is still alive. Um, then year 1613, again. Participating homelands, Grayslands, Lunatash, Prax, Sata. Outraged by the lunar presence and urged by social unrest, the Satyrites, the Sartorites rebelled in strength and temporarily expelled the lunar army. The lunars regrouped and under the leadership of General Fazur Widred, soundly defeated the rebels. The Red Emperor appointed Fazur Widred, the Governor General of Dragon Pass. If you're an old Tarshite, you get a minus 10 to this d20 roll. Let's see what happens. We rolled a 10, so that's a 1. So um, a normal year. Okay. Considering that survival is important, um, that's good. Um, you can also die of random causes, by the way. So 1615. Roll. Considering that she's a huntress, she's actually not okay. 1615. This time, my homeland is actually participating. We have the participating homelands of Grayslands, Luna Tarsh, and Old Tarsh. A squabble between the Grayslanders and the Lunas broke into open war. The former, aided by King Iron Hoof and his be beastmen, managed to evade and frustrate two massive invasion forces. So, if we are. Um, Okay, we just get to roll a d20 and there are no modifiers. Let's see, d20. And we roll a nine. It's a normal year again. <laughs> uh, that's funny. Okay, normal year. Uh. Here we are. We move to 1616. Participating homelands, Ezrolia and Prax. A large army from the Holy Country was ambushed and slaughtered by the Ditali barbarians. At the same time, Harek, the berserk, and his wolf pirates destroyed the Holy Country navy. Whatever that is. I have no idea because I haven't read, because there is no real world description in this book. The god king, king Belintar disappeared and the tournament of the masters of luck and death failed to produce a replacement. In Prax, a former slave of the bison people founded the White Bull Society. Many Praxians of all tribes flocked to join it. We're going to roll, and considering that we're old Tarsh, we get a minus 3 to our roll of a d20. Let's see where we are. 
And we land on a one. A normal year for all except Praxians. Okay, a normal year. So there wasn't much going on for my mum, was there? Normal year. Well, I mean, her father died in battle, so maybe she's quite happy that she doesn't have to do anything. 1618, participating homelands, Ezrolia. The Solanthi warlord Greymane led a massive army through Ditali and deep into the holy country, taking great plunder and avoiding a decisive battle. All others minus five to a d20 roll. Let's see. 13. Stayed in Notchet and watched the Western Barbarians pillage the countryside. Okay. Okay. So, stayed, whatever Notchet is. Um, stayed in Notchet and watched the Western Barbarians pillage pillage the countryside. But I did not gain any hatred for this. That's interesting. Then we have the year 1619 and the participating homelands are Luna Traarsh and Parax and Sata. The Luna army invaded northern Hendrikan lands and took the city of Kars. King Brojan of the Hendrik kings retreated to the fortress temple of Whitewall with his companions and withstood every lunar attempt to take the city. The Crimson Bat is sent to Dragon Pass to strike fear into any who would rebel against the emperor. Oltash gets minus 10 to this d20 roll. Let's see... And we roll a 11, an 11, so we get another normal year because that's a minus 10, a normal year. Um, 1620, participating homelands, Luna Tash, Prax, Sata. The Luna army decisively defeated the Malconwell army in battle and accepted their surrender. The Hendrikin king and his companions held out at Whitewall, defeating everything the Luna army threw against them, including the Crimson Bat. Let's roll a d20. We get a minus 10 to this roll. 15. We've got another normal year. So I will probably be lucky, which means my parent may still be alive. That's brilliant. And then we have the year 1621, participating homelands, all. A giant's cradle floated down the Zola Fell to the sea. The lunar army's attempts to seize it were thwarted by its defenders. After more than two years of siege and tremendous cost in blood, treasure and souls, the sacred fortress of Whitewall and, the Olanthi and its Olanthi defenders fell to the lunar army. The gods Orlanth and Analda were proclaimed dead and the great winter came to Dragon Pass, the holy country in Prax. The Red Emperor decreed a full year of celebration. If you are old, if you are... Altars, you get plus five to this roll. And this means we are at uh, 15. And this means the great winter year one. So we need to now look at what happened there. So we are now at the great winter. And here we get no modifier to our roll. So we're just going to roll a d20. And let's see what happens. We get a 16. We survived. That's good. We didn't die. So actually, I'm not reading what others are doing because I don't want to spoil it for myself. Great winter year one. Um, if your parents survived until now, congratulations. You should retire them with dignity because now it is time to determine your adventurer's background. Um, an adventurer aged 21 in 1625 would have come of age in 1622 and can now... So basically, you come of age at the age of 18. So now we're at 1622. So my mother is still alive, which is cool. So I'm now 18. And now we will roll on my history. So 1622. 
Participating homelands, all of them. The Red Emperor appointed Tatius the Bright as the Lunar Governor General of Dragon Pass, replacing Fazur Wide Red. King Broyan re-emerged and his Hendrikan tribe rose in rebellion, joined by many volunteers. Hordes of scorpion men emerged from Lanster's footprint, serving the chaos demigoddess called the Queen of Jab. I have no idea who these people are. The Great Winter continued until the Battle of the Auric Hills, when Broyan's rebel army ambushed and defeated the Lunar army by partially reviving Orlanth and Analda. They had been declared dead. The pro-lunar queen of Ezrolia was overthrown in a coup d'etat and civil war erupted in that land. 1622 event. Minus 5 to d20 rolls for tar old Tarshites. Let's see. And we get a 13. Great winter year 2. Below. Okay. Let's see. We need to roll again. And we don't get any modifiers, so we're just going to roll it a D18, a D20. And we rolled a 5. Oh my god, nearly froze to death. Kept alive by. Haha. <laughs> so, nearly froze to death. Great winter. Year two, nearly froze to death. Kept alive by, I'm not gonna read this now, I'm just gonna roll a d6 to see what happens. And I rolled a one. The love of another, gain love individual. Okay, kept alive by the love of another. I find it interesting because that can mean so many things. Um, so we gain love. The question is again, how many percentage points do we get? Um, Is that, then, is that then 60? Because, okay. Um, so 622, so 1623. Again, participating homelands. All of these. And the new Ezrolian queen gained a new ally when King Broyan and his ragged army of volunteers arrived and defeated the Graceland Horse Army. The Feathered Horse Queen was killed soon after by her own bodyguards. The Lunar Army arrived in Ezrolia and besieged Queen Samastina and King Broyan in Notchit. In the north, a gigantic swarm of trolls, trollkin, insects and darkness creatures crossed Dragon Pass en route to the Castle of Lead. That must have been a terrible sight. Let's see. We don't get a roll to this. 1623. Let's roll a d20 and see what happens. 17. Fought in the Siege of Notchet. Whoa. Okay. And then we have to um, we have the siege of Notchet where we get no modif modifiers to any die roll, and we're going to roll a d20, and it's a thirteen. Survived, and we take part in the Battle of Panel Ford. Um, panel Ford, but we also get something. 
And that is um, uh, sorry, plus five to battle skill. So now you can see how things that happen. I mean, my parents didn't really give me any um, any reputation that could have happened as well. Um, but let's see, battle skill. That's the battle skill, so we get plus five. So we have ten there anyway. So we get uh, we get fifteen, and now we need to move to page forty-three. Um. So basically, now is year sixteen twenty-four, um, and we actually don't get to choose. Uh, we don't get to roll at the beginning because we already know that we are moving to the Battle of Penelford. I, I cannot say how much I'm enjoying this character creation session. This is great. I really love the system. A new planet called the Boat Planet appeared in the sky, prophesizing doom and change. Harek the Berserk and his wolf pirates arrived in the holy country after circumnavigating the world. They allied with King Queen Samastina and King Broyan and routed, routed the lunar army at the Battle of Penel Fort. That's where we will be fighting. During the battle, Orlanth was freed from the underworld and the constellation called Orlanth's Ring appeared with additional stars and quickly rose to the top of the sky. After the battle, Harak's companion Argrat, a Sata ride from New Pavis, traveled with a small group of followers to the border of Sata and Prax and summoned the Praxian demigod Jaldon Goldentooth to recognize him as the White Bull. That winter, Harak and Broyan sacked the City of Wonders, the same winter Humati killed the lunar client, the lunar client King Temerchen of Bold Home. If you wish, roll a d6 minus one to determine the number of your adventurer's own siblings. Let's do this now. Probably I'll end up with none. Well, I've got two. That's good. Oh, favorite grandparent? Gramps. And he was a chariot driver. Which makes sense because he did die at a at a at a battle. And then favorite parent, mum. And she is a huntress. And still alive. <laughs> Um, so let's take a look at my siblings. Um, okay, so first of all, we're going to determine their gender. Number one is a boy. So I've got bro one. Then I have sis one. And then I have another sibling and that's uh, sis two. Let's see how they did, if they're still alive and if they're married and whatnot. Oh my God, this is terrible. So now this one is male and this one is female and female. Okay, and names will be provided later. Let's see, 1d10, they're probably all dead. <laughs> 1d20, I'm sorry. So this one is 19, dead and never married. So he's dead and never married. Second one. Um, 18, dead and never married. Oh, God. They might have died in the harsh winter. And this one is 12, so she is alive and unmarried. Unmarried. Okay. Cool. So, yeah. Um, Okie dokie. So now we are at the Siege of Notchet. That's where we are. We don't get any modifiers to this, so let's roll a naked d20 and see what happens. 14. You survived! Hey! Great! Oh, no, sorry. That was, sorry, that was Siege of Notch. Notch it. We are at the Panel Fort. Okay, so let's see. Year 1624. This is the new planet thing. Let's do this again. We, um, do we get any... No, we don't get anything. So we roll a 12. Survived! Woohoo! Add plus five to battle. We get plus five to our battle skill. Yeah, this is going well. Um, 
so we're now at 20. Um, so that's all, and then we have the year 1625. And um, here we have the following things happening to us. Participating homelands all, the current year. With the White Bull Society behind him, Argrath liberated Parvis from the Lunar Empire and was proclaimed King of Parvis. Argrath led his Praxian allies to Dragon Pass but was defeated by Lunar Sorcery and retreated to Parvis. At the same time, King Broyan was killed by Lunar Sorcery. The Lunar Empire gathered thousands of magicians, priests and nobles to consecrate the new temple of the Reaching Moon and extend the lunar glow line over all of Dragon Pass. A group of Sartorite hero questers, here we have the hero questers from the previous video, so these were kind of like the superheroes at the time, led by Kalia Starbrow, invaded, invaded the lunar ceremony and summoned a true dragon beneath the temple. The dragon devoured the temple and the attendees in minutes. Most of the military and magical might of, lunar, of the Lunar Empire in the province was annihilated. The true dragon then rose into the sky, revealing its impossible size. It was several kilometers long. It flew up high into the middle air towards the red moon. Millions of observers across Genertila witnessed the event. Those in Peloria, Raelius, Kralorila, and the far west saw a dragon-shaped cloud obscure the red moon. Those closer saw and heard far more. Across Dragon Pass, ancient draconic powers and thoughts qu quiescent, since, quiescent since the Empire of Worms friends were, were awakened. Sorry. Across Dragon Pass, ancient draconic powers and thoughts quiescent since the Empire of Worms friends were awakened. In the lunar capital of Glamour, the Red Emperor sacrificed much of his magic and power to drive the dragon back. The true dragon spiralled around Dragon Pass, circled Mount Carrow Finn, and then returned to the huge crevice it had made where once stood the new lunar temple. Kala Starbrow marched on Bold Home and proclaimed herself Prince of Sata. Oh, that's a woman. A lunar Tash army led by General Fazua Wydred, he's the guy that got ousted, indecisively fought the Free Sata army. The Lunar Tash army retreated after Fazur learned that King Farandros, the King of Tash and Fazur's nephew, had murdered many of Fazur's kin and supporters while, they, while the mighty general was away campaigning. General Fazur returned to Dunstop and gathered allies. In Old Tash, the Shaker priestess appointed a new king of Wintertop rather than allow Fazur's son Onjur to become the king. So... 1625 events. We get no modifiers to this die roll. Let's roll a d20 and see what happens to us. 20. Participated in the liberation of Parvis. Below. No modifiers. And we're going to roll a d20 to see what happens. 5. Nearly killed in battle. Oh. Okay. That's interesting. Nearly killed at the liberation of Parvis. And I get a distinctive scarf, a uh, scar, and that's actually going to go over my right eye. Um Okay, so um, that's it. So, uh, oh no, sorry, we get a plus five in battle. So we're now 25, we have seen action and quite a lot of it. Okay, that's cool. So, every, so now this is done, we now go to the step three rune affinities. Now this has been going on for 54 minutes, so I'm gonna upload this um, now, so uh, steps one through three. And I'll talk to you in the next video.